Charged Up, Episode 1, Hillary Henders Hunt, How to Keep Your Financial Resolutions. Are you ready to get charged up about your money, your credit, and your overall financial health? You've come to the right place. You're listening to Charged Up with Jenny Hoff. Welcome to Charged Up. I'm your host, Jenny Hoff. This is our first episode and one of many that I hope will be interesting and inspirational discussions about money and credit and how you can take control of your financial life. Coming out of the holidays, I wanted to focus this first discussion on our financial resolutions, since a lot of us make them after the binge spending that happens over the holidays. And I'm very excited for this interview with Hillary Hendershot. She's a certified financial planner. She owns the company Hillary Hendershot Financial. She's been featured in numerous publications and on news shows with her fantastic strategies on how to master your money. She's given a TEDx talk, and she has her own podcast, Profit Boss Radio. But despite all of this expertise and her down-to-earth approach to taking charge of your finances, Hillary has also experienced her own financial problems. So her solutions aren't just theoretical, they actually work. Let's find out how. Well, Hillary, thanks so much for joining us today. It's it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Jenny. I'm happy to be here. So one of the first things I like to do is talk to my guests about their own personal journeys with finance, because I think it's important that people understand everyone at some point has been confused, anxious, and scared about their financial situation. Whether you're making tons of money and you just don't know how to take care of it and how to budget it, whether you're not making very much money at all and you just keep getting into debt and you don't know how to dig yourself out of that hole. I think it's someplace that a lot of us have been, but nobody ever likes to talk about it. I mean, we don't even talk about our salaries, right? So nobody really likes to talk about it. And maybe it's something from what we experienced growing up in our families, or it's just so confusing that it makes us insecure. So I want to talk to you first because you've been open about the fact that you you went through your own financial issues, your struggles, figuring out what yes. was right for you to stay on track, to not be in debt. So can you talk a little bit about that journey and how you got there and how you got out of there? Yes. So I like to start in the middle because it gives you a, sen- a good sense of how bad things had gotten. So at one point I was driving this convertible uh, silver BMW and this was um, like several years ago. I was working in financial planning at the time, but I, I pull into a Chevron station to get a, a tank of gas and I put my credit card in the machine and it got declined mm-hmm. and I tried another credit card and it got declined. And at that point I had no credit cards in my wallet that had any room left on them, either balance in the account or, or credit left on the limit. Mm. And, um, and, and I had to leave my car at the Chevron station. And as I'm walking home, I realize I have drained my 401k. I have drained my retirement accounts and, um, and I'm not sure how I'm going to make my next house payment. And I, I was, I was mortified. I mean, Jenny, I'm able to tell this story with a lot of clarity now, but I was so ashamed. You know, I was, I felt like a drag on society. Like I'm the worst kind of person out there. I'm irresponsible. How did it get this bad? And I, and I made a decision. I made I decided that that's not how my life was going to go, that I didn't know why I had good intentions and bad results. I mean, at that point, I was a certified financial planner. I have a very thorough understanding of the stock markets and investing, and I'm advising multimillionaires during the day, and I come home to a stack of bills that I won't open because I can't pay them. And I was a chronic overspender. And so I said to myself, you know, I'm looking around. There are people who are in my cohort, my colleagues who professionally were sort of in the same place in our lives. They're building wealth. I'm not. What's the difference? And I know that that difference was behavior. Obviously, it's behavior and behavior comes from psychology. So I said, all right, let me let me figure out what I can figure out. So I read everything I could get my hands on about behavioral finance, about money psychology. I really became an expert on neuropsychology. At one point, several years ago, I did give a TEDx talk called The Surprising Power of Language to Make You Rich because it turns out that our money lives are dictated by our beliefs about money, which give rise to our conversations about money. So beliefs and language are very, very closely intertwined. And we have all kinds of superstitions about money. I mean, people are basically crazy about money. And what I discovered is that I had at some very early point in my life, um, my mom was a good budgeter. Things didn't feel luxurious in the home. Don't get me wrong. I didn't go without, except there were things I thought that I, well, things I did want that I didn't get. 
And so I decided that there's never enough money. And I had gone and persisted in my life to perpetuate that superstition. And it seems really counterintuitive, but when someone earns, and I was earning income at that time. I mean, obviously I had a BMW and a condo and and I had a good job. When when you have money come in, but you have the belief that there's never enough money, the only thing to do is spend it. You have hmm. to get it out of your ecosystem because that doesn't jive with your with your belief about money. And you know, the brain is a really powerful thing. So when I was able to um, turn that pattern on its ear, um, I got really clear with myself that I needed to build wealth instead of debt and did everything that I needed to do to do it. At this point, um, I have built a thriving business. I paid off the debt. I refunded the retirement accounts and given the value of my business. And I say this just to let people know that anything is possible. Given the value of the saleable business that I've built, I'm definitely a seven-figure net worth at this point. And, And I said to myself, as I'm on that upward track, what I bet I can give this away. Right. And Mm -hmm. so I started talking about it publicly. I did mention, I did, um, I've done public speaking on the topic and it's something that really inspires me. So not only was I able to, to turn around what was a very destructive situation in my own life, but now it's my intention to give it away. So let's talk a little bit about debt because that's been the subject of this month. And I think a lot of people coming out of the holidays are experiencing a lot of debt that they did not intend to have. Why is it so crippling to the mindset and limiting to our freedom? I think that debt is a little bit like a psychic leech. It's an unfunded promise. It's a responsibility you know you have. And when you have more debt than you can pay off in a month, you never really know how you're going to pay it off. It's like people think that being rich is about how much you get to spend, but it's not. Being rich is about how much you get to keep. And that was a major fallacy in my own thinking. I wanted people to think I was rich so that they would think I was successful. And um, that came from kind of an an inadequacy in myself about not thinking I was successful or not being enough, right? Being insecure. And so I was using money to kind of stop that hole up. But there's so much messaging out there directed at American consumers about how, you know, how you need to spend money to make things all right. And the vast majority of us live in far better conditions than even like the royalty of the Holy Roman Empire. You know, we have it pretty darn good. You have a smartphone, a flat screen television, a laptop, a microwave central heat and and a car. Right. So, you know, why are you spending so much? Debt is a weakness in the system. A lot of people think, almost everyone who comes to me thinks they have an income problem, but it's almost always a spending problem. Debt weakens your financial position so that all of that spending you're doing on entertainment or self-care or clothes or hairstylists, it's not making you happier. And that's the ruse, really. Every time you plunk down a credit card to buy something you think you want, you're weakening your position in life. And it's a big deal. Let's talk about financial resolutions because I know that is something that's on a lot of people's minds. You probably make health resolutions and financial resolutions, some of the most common ways to start off the new year. And we also know that those well-intentioned plans like the diet and the financial resolutions can often lay by the wayside if we don't really have a good plan. So what do you say first is the biggest reason people don't keep their financial resolutions? And then I want to get into your ways for them to keep their financial resolutions. I would guess 80% of people don't keep their financial resolutions. Um, it's very difficult for human beings just to apply discipline in an area of life that's already filled up with ways of being. It's like physics. If the space is full. And unless you clear some space, unless you like take out other habits, any way of being that you force or forcefully try to apply is just going to feel, it's going to feel really difficult. It's going to feel like work. And in the case of spending less, it's going to feel like scarcity and it's going to eventually get pushed out. You're going to rebel from yourself. (laughs) So that's why you have to go to work on your money script or money superstition, which I call the money operating system and really just immerse yourself in new habits. I'm that walk home. I call that my financial walk of shame. Um, I decided, you know, I had been doing all these things to hide what was going on in my financial life. And I decided I wasn't going to do them anymore. So I forced myself to like call five friends and tell them, look, I'm broke. (laughs) 
you know, and that was a, that's what I mean by kind of clearing some space. Um, often with bad financial habits, just like bad food habits, we are compensating for something else. I mean, I worked with a woman once who was spending a lot of money on clothes and personal travel and eating out in restaurants by herself. And what we realized was that she was compensating for not engaging in social relationships, not having social connection by spending money on herself to make herself feel better. So she was able, she wasn't going to just stop spending money and stay home alone and be lonely. She had to go out and get more balance in her life when she did make the effort to be social with actual people her excess spending kind of cleared up naturally. You do have great tips on how to reduce spending and even reduce the temptation to spend more. What actions did you take besides telling yourself or calling your friends? What actions did you take specifically, whether it was using only cash or whatever tricks or tips that you used to make yourself stick to a budget? First, how did you even compose a budget? How can we do that? And then how do you stick to it? Yes. Okay. So the first thing is, yes, money lives in the real world world. Like you can think about money all you want, but you have to actually manage it. You have to actually know, understand and have a, have your arms wrapped around your cash flow. And when I say cash flow, I mean how much money comes in and how much goes out. And you have to measure it in small enough time periods that you can, you can actually wrap your brain around the numbers. They become real for you. There's clarity. So first thing, sit down and you're going to probably resist this step, but I need to know how much money is coming in. Like for example, do you have 26 pay periods a year or do you have 24? What is your exact net income over a one month period? And now look at what are your debts? So I need a measure of the income and assets. So, but for most people, if they're in debt, it's going to be a negative net worth. Um, and we need to know how much credit card debt is there? How much tuition debt is there? What are your debt payments, your required payments every month? So that gives you your assets minus your debts is your net worth. And then when we know the income number, we can decide how to distribute those dollars. Every dollar that comes in to your ecosystem should have a job. It should it should be assigned a role. So instead of, first of all, people hate budgets, uh, like 3% of people on the planet, and most of them are engineers, like budgets and spreadsheets <laughs> and Quicken and like that. For most people, it just becomes another thing to feel guilty about not doing. So don't do it. So I teach a financial automation system. I used it for myself. I've taught it to people paying off six figures of credit card debt and my most wealthy investment client use it. So it scales infinitely. And essentially, instead of dividing your spending into categories like utilities, clothes, trips, gas, like that. No one likes to count that way. I invite you to categorize your spending based on when you made the decision to spend it. This is very important and it won't be intuitive to you. So you're probably going to have to actually try it to really get a sense of how powerful it is. But people who do it love it. First, you have your um, what I call your yesterday's promises number. Now, these titles are a little kitschy and that's okay. It really works. So you have yesterday's promises, which is your overhead. Anything, when you, you Wake up on the first of the month, Jenny, you know there are expenses you have to pay this month. Your rent, your gym memberships, your life insurance, your car insurance, your utilities. I want a list of that monthly obligation number. That is your yesterday's promises number. The rest is for decisions that you make in the moment. That's called today's fun. And then tomorrow's dreams, the things you're saving for, be they short-term or long-term goals. Most people make their savings decisions after they've made their spending decisions. I invite you to turn that around and to decide how much you're going to. Now, if you're paying off debt, instead of putting it in savings, you're gonna be paying off that credit card. But as soon as you pay off the credit card, you're just gonna keep that money going, except it's not gonna to go to Visa anymore. Now it's gonna to go to your Bank of America account. I have one single spending account. It's called Today's Fund. Literally, it says that when I log into my bank, it says it on a label on the card in my wallet. It's the only, I, I use credit cards now for the points. I don't carry balances, but there was a very long period of time. I had no credit cards. So just like you suggested, I carried only one, debit card in my account. And that was the today's fun spending. That's like my allowance. And now everything, every, every time I make a decision to spend in the moment, it goes on that card, gas, clothing, gifts, 
uh, transportation, my hairstylist, lunch today, whether I buy it or brown bag it, it doesn't matter. That's today's fun because I made this the decision today. And in that way, when you get to the end of that bank account balance at the end of the pay period, you can spend that account to zero, but your financial system is still working. It's still a well-oiled machine. Your uh, expenses are funded and your debt payments or your savings is funded. And in, th in that way, so I say, you know, if you want to spend on a Gucci bag, sure, you take it out of your today's fun account and then you just be, better be prepared to eat beans for the rest of the two weeks. <laughs> and so there was a time when I had $1,000 it may have been six six hundred dollars. I don't know. Uh, going into my today's fun account, and that's a small enough number that when you and I go to dinner, and you say, "Hillary, do you want to have wine?" and I look at my bank account balance, and if it's five hundred dollars, I might say yes. But if it's twenty two dollars, you better bet I'm saying no. And that's what I mean by you, you start to right size your spending. It, it's a it's a system that works really beautifully and all you have to do is not overspend. No, I love that. And I want to go into that a little bit more. So do you have a spend down card then or do you have a card with a certain limit? I actually use a points credit card. I get about a 3% cash rebate. And what I do is I watch the balance every two. I just have, I have a accounts aggregator. I use a tool called eMoney and I watch the balance of the card go up. So, you know, right now it's at $232 and I know that I have $1,000 total. So when it gets to about $990, I just stop spending and I write a check from my Today's Fund account to the visa or I just transfer the money. Yeah. So my visa gets paid off every two weeks without fail, religiously. So with your future spending account, what is that? Is that another credit card or is that, how does that work? Tomorrow's Dreams is, um, I have a, a saving, they're all savings accounts. So I have one for my next car. I always pay cash for cars. I have one for holiday spending. So I have a drama free Christmas season every year. And then, then my IRAs and my, I mean, now I have a, a I have actually have a solo 401k in my business, but I consider all those savings accounts to be in the tomorrow's dreams category because I'm funding short-term and long-term dreams. And if you were saving for to pay for the kids' college, that would be there or saving for a house, that would be there as well. I love that idea. It's very simple. Split it into these three categories instead of, because I've tried the apps like Mint and stuff and straight to, okay, how much am I going to spend on groceries this much? How much am I going to spend? Oh, how and are it, you going to predict that? Yeah, it's exhausting by the time you've even set up the account that I don't even want to look at it again. And so I like that idea of just saying, okay, these it's very simple. Is this a debt I have to pay every month? Is this something that I want to buy right now? Or is this something that I'm funding for the future? Um, I think that's a great tip to use. And I really really recommend people try it out. I'd love to hear people if they have tried it out and they're successful, just write me at charged up at creditcards.com. And oh my God, that's a great email address. <laughs> <laughs> and also go to your Hillary's website, hillaryhendershot.com. You have a lot of information on there and about your services, your programs and all of that kind of stuff. So I really recommend it. I love this kind of approach to, to budgeting your money without making it so exhausting that you just don't want to do it. Let's also now talk to what people need to do to psychologically get started with this. I love the approach. I think that it's probably very useful and a lot of people, if they do it, will be successful in saving money. How do we get to that place psychologically where we actually sit down and do it? <laughs> um, you had your moment at the gas station. Yeah. So, so does somebody need a this, moment uh, like that or... So there's a man named George Kinder who wrote a book called The Seven Stages of Money Maturity. And this book became really seminal in my industry. There are whole, there's actually a whole training institute founded around it. Um, let's talk about, to answer your question about how do you get ready to uh, turn your financial life around, I want to talk about just the first three stages of money maturity. The first is innocence. And innocence is comprised of superstitions about money. Um, there's no planning, no no budgeting, no dialogue about money that's analytical in any way happening in that stage. And we've all known people in that stage. When you when you try to talk to them about money, if they have bad habits, they, they just don't hear you. They don't listen. They're not there yet. They haven't sort of woken up to that money is a thing to be managed and, and that it can actually improve your life. And the second stage is pain. And 
we've talked about my pain in this episode and everyone suffers a different kind of money pain that propels them to the next stage. Some people have more financial pain than I did, some less. My husband was so minimal, he can't even remember ever Mm -hmm. having been in pain. (laughs) And the third stage is awareness. Now, some people can actually use pain to ping them back into innocence. I'll give you an example. Um, Say there's a couple, they're in their 60s, they realize they only have $20,000 saved for retirement. So they take that $20,000 and they buy lottery tickets. That's an example of the realization that they're, they're not ready for retirement is pain. And then they choose to let it ping them back into innocence by buying the lottery tickets. And we sort of all know how that story likely will go. Um, but at the point you're in pain, you are ready to sort of move through the portal into the next stages. And, and that next one is awareness. And awareness is characterized by the ability to be in productive dialogue and plan. So the things that you and I've talked about today, Jenny, the sitting down, valuing your net worth, adding up the numbers that allow you to manage your cash flow, you have to be in the stage of awareness to actually do that. So you know if it's time for you. If you've been sitting in pain for weeks or months and it's time to take action, there's no time like the present. And really every day that you put it off is another day of pain. And I will say that when I, I had to go pretty scarce in my life for a while. I mean, I, I was in a pretty bad situation and it did feel like doing without for a while. I mean, I wasn't destitute, but I definitely did not have a lot of the things that I want in my life. But man, things change pretty quickly. They start to sort of compound and become exponential. And and it was a character building experience. <laughs> um, and so I guess what I'm my core message is like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. If you start to do the right things, things get thing, you'll be surprised how quick that can snowball for you. And do you think people should limit how many credit cards they have? I think if you're in debt that you should cut up your credit cards. I think you should absolutely disallow yourself to use credit cards until you're 100% confident that you'll pay them off every two weeks. You know, some people say, oh, put them in a, literally put them on ice, which I think is kind of cute. Put it in a glass and fill the glass with water and put it in the freezer. So if you want to use the credit card, you have to wait the eight or 16 hours it would take for the glass of ice to melt, which I think is cute. But honestly, why do you need credit cards? Credit cards are only... People say for emergencies, but you should be in a point in your life where you have cash on hand for unexpected events. And there just aren't that many unexpected events. And I mean, your car breaking down is not an emergency. Your house needing a new roof is not an emergency. These things happen. You just don't know when. So uh, I, in my opinion, credit cards are for rewards, rewards programs. So I don't think you need credit cards at all. And if you, if you can't be trusted with them, then you have to take them away from yourself. I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. <laughs> we all go through it and we, we develop different habits. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with even how we're raised and what we've experienced and seen. And we don't learn about it in school. And so it's something that we kind of really fumble with and try to understand. And that's what I hope. And that's what you do with your work, and that's what I hope that we do here, is to kind of educate people a little bit about you can control your money and you can control how you feel about money, but it takes those first few steps. And so one of the things that I really want to reiterate about what you said is just one time, sit down, do that nasty work of calculating how much you bring in, how much you owe every month, how much your net is, and just do that part and then split it up into those three categories and then go from there and, and don't break the rules that you've set for yourself and you'll find yourself pretty quickly start getting out of that miserable cycle of debt. Finally, our show is called Charged Up. So I want to ask you, what gets you charged up about being financially independent? Yeah. So First of all, I don't know. I wouldn't actually say I'm financially independent. I define that as being uh, confident that at my current standard of living, I could live for the rest of my life, which is likely to be 60 years or more. I mean, I just turned 40. So, but I'm very close and I will get there. And it is, um, yeah, it just feels good. I mean, let me tell you, I've been broke and I've, I've been in a situation now where, you, you know, you could say I'm, I'm wealthy or rich and, And it's just better this way. And there's a whole set of concerns that you don't have anymore. There's a whole set of concerns that you can handle with money. And you can really start to specialize at what you're good at. And you can buy the one resource we can never get back, which is time. And being someone who just had my first baby this year, my time with her is absolutely precious. And I'm glad that at 6 o'clock, I have the support around me to stop working and go spend the evening with her. 
Oh, congratulations. That's great Thanks. to hear. Well, thank you so much, Hillary. This has been a very enlightening conversation. I really recommend people try out these tools. It's not super difficult. It doesn't require any fancy apps. It just requires sitting down one day, do the calculations, and then start spending what you can afford and not spending um, what you can't afford. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Jenny, for having me. And thank you for joining me for our first episode of Charged Up. We're going to be interviewing financial experts from creditcards.com, authors, inspirational individuals, so that you can take charge of your finances and learn about good money stewardship. This isn't just about money, it's about life. Credit, finances, debt affect every area of our lives, our happiness, our peace of mind. And when you can control this, you can start controlling those other parts of your life and start enjoying life a little bit more without having to constantly swipe a credit card to do that. If you have questions that you want me to answer or address on the show, shoot me an email at chargedup at creditcards.com. I'll do my best to get them answered. And meanwhile, get charged up about your financial future. We got this. for joining me for our first episode of Charged Up. We're going to be interviewing financial experts from creditcards.com, authors, inspirational individuals, so that you can take charge of your finances and learn about good money stewardship. This isn't just about money, it's about life. Credit, finances, debt affect every area of our lives, our happiness, our peace of mind. And when you can control this, you can start controlling those other parts of your life and start enjoying life a little bit more without having to constantly swipe a credit card to do that. If you have questions that you want me to answer or address on the show, shoot me an email at chargedup at creditcards.com. I'll do my best to get them answered. And meanwhile, get charged up about your financial future. We got this.